You're listening to the Fertility Docs Uncensored Podcast, featuring insight on all things fertility from some of the top-rated doctors around America. Whether you're struggling to conceive or just planning for your future family, we're here to guide you every step of the way. Hello, and welcome to Fertility Docs Uncensored. I am Dr. Carrie Bediant of the Fertility Center of Las Vegas, and I am delighted to be here with my two gorgeous friends, as always, Dr. Susan Hudson from Texas Fertility Center. Hello. And Dr. Abby Eblin from Nashville Fertility Center. Hey, everybody. And this week we have a special guest with us. I am delighted to introduce um, Amanda Klein. She is one of my lovely patients. And so we'll be talking to her in in detail about her fertility journey because she's she's hit a, a lot of the marks that many of our patients have proportionally have hit um, in terms of diagnoses and in terms of just what kind of processes they've gone through and how how we have gotten together. But we were talking a little bit about her background because Amanda is like many of, of our patients. I, I'm, I have a suspicion that both of you guys have very similar practices and that I talk to my patients and I feel like, oh my God, these women are just phenomenal. I mean, they put type A to shame <laughs> working phenomenal jobs and doing volunteering and, 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 and so in talking to Amanda, she's got, she's got quite a bit of backstory too, beyond all the the fertility focused story. But as a part of that, Abby, you were telling us about a wedding that you went to. Well, you haven't really told much about Amanda yet, so I don't want to steal your thunder, but Amanda, needless to say, is a very pretty lady and she's beauty queen. And I was just talking about how, you know, being a five foot woman and, you know, probably, I was in a junior miss pageant once and I got runner up, but (laughs) (laughs) we live in Nashville. My husband ended up meeting a former Miss America and that's a story in of itself, but he met her and we got to be friends with her and her fiance. And so um, as it turned out, we ended up getting invited to her wedding in Florida. She was a former Miss Florida and then Miss America. And so at the wedding, it was a fairly small wedding. But about every other woman that was there was a former Miss America. <laughs> Lee Merriweather was there. For those of you who watch Batman, Lee Merriweather was the first cat woman, and she was beautiful. Wow. Um, and, you know, you could just, you know, there's just a difference between just the average female and, you know, somebody who's a former Miss America. So it was a really neat wedding to be at, but I kind of felt short and dumpy and... <laughs> <laughs> Not quite of the same. I didn't gleam the same way that the, the other ladies there gleamed for the most part. <laughs> and for our listeners, I want to say that even on a day that Abby is not like all like dressed up, she is one of the most elegant looking women on the planet. Oh, yes. so, well, thank you, I Susan. Mean... It's Maybe it's my gray <laughs> hair. I don't know. But thank you. <laughs> so, it, so Amanda is Mrs. Nevada, which is is an achievement in and of itself. Like I didn't realize, I mean, to me, the thought of being in a pageant strikes fear deep into my heart and gives me palpitations because the thought of putting on makeup in a way where other people are going to actually look at you and walk in heels and all that. I mean, you guys, you got to see Amanda when she's all all prepped and like, yes, he does. <laughs> she's beautiful now just on a, a random call, but oh my God. Um, and, and so um, Amanda, I tell us about about all of the stuff that you set up and how you got into pageantry and all of that, because you are, when I first met you, I was like, there's no way this, this woman would be a beauty queen, not because you're not gorgeous, but because you just, you have your, your everything together. And so I would not have, I would not have guessed, not that I know any beauty queens really know what the type is, but I just, I wouldn't have guessed. And you just, you've got, you've got this phenomenal story. So tell. Oh, well, thank you. And and thank you so much for having me on today. This is amazing. This is a great way to uh, spend my Sunday afternoon. Um, but I am Mrs. Nevada. Um, my actual title is USOA Mrs. Nevada 2020. And what that means is that I compete in a system called uh, the United States of America pageant. Um, so I was crowned uh, last November as Mrs. Nevada. And, you know, one of the silver linings of COVID is that I got to keep my crown a little bit longer. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> so, and I will show it to you. And I know that most of the listeners out there won't be able to see, but oh it's a very goodness. sparkly crown. It's just so gorgeous. <laughs> and it has a very sparkly sash that I have gotten to wear um, throughout my year. Unfortunately, with the pandemic. I haven't gotten to wear it as much as I would have liked. Um, but you know, everybody's, everybody's journey and everybody's year is different. And I think, you know, it was just meant to be that I was 2020 for a multitude of reasons. Um, but yeah, I, I competed for three years, um, before I finally won. Um, I did end up switching systems, which I think made a huge difference for me, but, uh, there's nothing better for me to be on stage. I love it. And, uh, the way that I got into it actually was I had just had my first miscarriage and my coworker, I found out through a friend that my coworker was competing in this Mrs. Pageant, which who knew there was a Mrs. Pageant for us, <laughs> you know, married ladies. And so I went over to her at a, a work thing and I said, I know this is your personal life and you probably don't want to share with me, but I need to know everything. I need this in my life right now. (laughs) Cause I had, I had gained some weight through the pregnancy and I just wasn't feeling like myself and kind of realized, wow, I haven't done anything for myself in a really long time. So that's how I got into pageantry originally. And it just kind of snowballed this amazing journey and this ability to give back to women and couples in infertility. So were you competing at the time you were going through fertility treatments as well? Uh, I started competing before I went through infertility. I had had my first miscarriage, had no idea. We just assumed, you know, it's so common and, um, you know, we'll try again. Um, And as I continued to compete, I also continued to miscarry. I had three total. Wow. Wow. You know, it was just, it's like the universe put me on this path, you know, I feel like. And even the first two years, I was really focused on my work in the cancer community. I didn't really talk about my story with infertility. And then finally I said, you know what, I've just got to be honest and I've just got to share what's going on with me and my husband. And it was like the floodgates opened up Mm -hmm. once I... Once I told everyone what was going on with us. That's amazing. So you set up, um, you set up all this, all these different events as you were going through your year while you were competing and while you were going through fertility treatment. Because by this point I knew you. Um, and so we were already well into our journey. So there were, there was at least one, one event that we spoke at where you had brought in another you know, very well-known speaker who had had fertility journeys. And let me tell you, if the two of you ladies have never gotten up on stage with a Mrs. Nevada and a, re- she, I don't want to call her a reality TV star because that doesn't, that's like, that's not enough. Yeah. But, um, but these two beautiful women, I mean, it will shake your, your <laughs> self identity and security to yeah. its core. Oh, like the wedding of Miss Americas. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, there's there's actually an REI physician who's um, I for, I don't know where she ultimately landed. I knew her when she was in fellowship, but she um, at all the conferences. Whenever I would see her, I would just like I'm going to fade into the wall here, <laughs> just hide away. But um, but Amanda, you set up some really wonderful things, and and we have seen each other multiple times throughout this year, not just for fertility, like personal fertility treatment but also for other causes as well, because you've gotten involved into advocacy in part, I think, because of your position as Mrs. Nevada, but also because of your other, you know, your other desires in your personal life. Absolutely. You know, when I first told my story and and our story. I'm an only child. I apologize. I say I and me a lot, but there is another person in this dynamic and his name is Mark and he's my husband and he's lovely. Dr. B will tell you he's great. He puts up with me. Um, But before we started on this journey, um, I was very quiet. I didn't talk about it with anybody except my my closest friends and family. And then when I started talking about what was going on with the miscarriages and, you know, potentially having to go down the non-traditional traditional route of, uh, of having a family, women reached out to me from all over the country, from all over the world. Friends who I've known my entire life started saying, I've been going through the exact same thing for five years. We've been dealing with this for, you know, it's been a struggle in our marriage, all of these things. And I said, okay, 
we've got to first start having a conversation. Um, and so uh, Emily Simpson, who is on the Real Housewives of Orange County, they call them Bravo liberties. I would <laughs> okay. Bravo liberty. I like that. Yeah, like I would say she's more like a celebrity than a reality star because she's just amazing. So I'm going to put her in that category. Um, but she, she's awesome. And she uh, unfortunately had lost her twins at four months and had no. to had to deliver um, uh, stillborn babies. So, you know, she was such an inspiration to me that she was sharing her story on national television. She came out to Las Vegas and shared with, you know, a group of women, um, here in, in our community. And, and that was kind of the beginning of a much larger conversation. Um, since then I, uh, started my own nonprofit organization. It's called Nevada Fertility Advocates. And right now we're working on a bill, um, for the legislative session that's coming up in February here in the state of Nevada. Um, And then I've also worked with Resolve, the National Infertility Association, um, and went to, like Dr. Bedian said, I I went to um, Washington, D.C. and met with our congresswomen to talk about broader infertility coverage. So, Amanda, how did finding a venue, for you it was the Mrs. Nevada pageants, how did finding something outside of your normal everyday life impact your personal fertility journey? It was everything. Um, so I had a boyfriend before my husband who um, clearly was not nice enough to be my husband, <laughs> <laughs> but he he made a comment to me one time. I, I work in healthcare marketing. I, um, I probably one of the reasons why I was so excited about putting an event together, right? Um, I've been in marketing my entire career and I was really working a ton when he and I were dating. And he said to me, you know, you need to get a hobby. And that cut me to the core. Cause I was like, my hobby is work and I am intense, <laughs> <laughs> you know, 28 years old, trying to climb the corporate ladder. Um, but it's true. I needed a hobby. I needed an outlet. I needed, uh, I needed something that fed my soul on the, on a creative level. And that for me has been pageantry. It's been, um, you know, speaking out. Um, and for a lot of my friends who are are going through infertility or have gone through infertility, they've found outlets that have, you know, whether it's going to a support group or, you know, writing a book, there's just so many ways that you can start to feel human again through this experience. I think that's a great suggestion. I think so many people, and you know, they just, they get so involved in kind of what's going on with their fertility journey and they do a lot of online searches. And I, I just, I think with anything, no matter what it is, if you just focus solely on that to the exclusion of a lot of other things, and, and like you said, things that feed your soul, that, that can be really devastating. And so I think that's, I love that. I think that exactly, they need, everybody needs something that feeds their soul, soul outside of whatever it is, whatever problem they're dealing with. Yeah, for sure. So let's do, let's do our question of the week, because it's kind of related to, to this topic. And then um, and then let's come back to Amanda and all of all of her story kind of from the beginning. So the question that we have is, do you notice a difference in the rate of miscarriage between IVF patients and women that get pregnant without intervention? And and that's that's really a phenomenal question. And um, and my guess is that this particular question at uh, ask her because I'm sure she's a brilliant woman with that brilliant woman just like Amanda is. I think she is asking if there's a difference in women with fertility issues who have IVF and then have subsequent miscarriages versus women with infertility issues. Who get pregnant without intervention? Because that's a very different question than is there a difference in miscarriage rate between women who just spontaneously get pregnant who've never had any fertility issues? So, Dr. Hudson, you have an opinion, you have thoughts? I have all kinds of opinions. So, um, <laughs> so I, I think number one, it depends on kind of what bells and whistles you do with your IVF. Okay. I, I mean, we know that most miscarriages are going to be due to chromosomal abnormalities. And with IVF, or at least 50%, we think. Exactly. And so, you know, with IVF, we do have the ability and even luxury of testing the embryos to make sure that they are chromosomally normal, thereby decreasing that 
as a cause. Now, um, you will, if you've been to see a reproductive endocrinologist and you have recurrent pregnancy loss, you know, you may have heard that most people with recurrent pregnancy loss are going to be eventually successful. And I totally believe that's true. The hard part I think that a lot of our patients have is that this is very much a heart and a mind decision. And it's a decision that only you and your partner can make because I honestly have had some patients who have had six, seven, eight, nine miscarriages and were eventually successful. And those couples have the mental and emotional ability to be able to sustain that amount of loss. Not everybody can or wants to go through that life experience. And so I think that is a benefit of, of the services we can we can have. Now, I do think that we have a lot of first trimester bleeding, <laughs> not necessarily miscarriages that happens in IVF pregnancies as compared to non-IVF pregnancies. So Susan, why are IVF pregnancies, you keep saying with IVF, people tend to do better. What specifically do we do in IVF that makes people have a lower miscarriage rate potentially? Well, we're picking out embryos that are chromosomally normal, thereby taking out the major cause of miscarriage. There's lots of other causes, but that's going to be the biggest one. And what percent of just healthy women in their 20s, would you say, have abnormal embryos? If they had 10 embryos to choose from, how many would be genetically abnormal on average? Half of them. So yeah, and, that, and I think people find that really difficult to believe that even the youngest, healthiest, most fertile woman, 50-50 chance that her embryos are going to be abnormal. And as women age beyond the age of 35, it just gets higher and higher and higher. And I think as Amanda can attest to, sometimes we're totally sort of dumbfounded by the fact that none of the embryos are normal, even in a really young, otherwise healthy woman. One thing I would like to mention is for for our listeners, um, we're talking about these really high numbers <laughs> of chromosomally abnormal embryos. But the important thing to understand is that you're, if you are doing something short of IVF, realize that most of those abnormal embryos are never going to implant as a pregnancy. And most of the time that when they do implant, most of them are going to be lost in miscarriage. That's the reason why live birth rates of children with chromosomal abnormalities is actually pretty darn small in most age groups. All right. So I would I would definitely agree with all that. I think you guys summed it up really pretty nicely. Um, one thing that I would add is even with the genetic testing that we do with IVF, it doesn't eliminate miscarriages completely because it can tell if there is one chromosome out of place, either missing or duplicated. What it cannot tell is if there is a gene on there that's crucial, that's missing, because a lot of those, we don't necessarily know what they are and where they are. And even when you do whole exon, uh, whole exome sequencing, that doesn't necessarily tell you everything you need to know. So that's one thing. Um, and the other thing is that you can have a complete, completely duplicated set of genes. So instead of having 46, you've got 69. And even though the number sounds all sexy and romantic, uh, <laughs> when it comes to when it comes to genetics, it is not at all. I wouldn't have ever thought about that, <laughs> Carrie, but you're right. That's because you don't live in Las Vegas. Um, <laughs> but it is one of those things where you really have to see, is there something out of line? Because if you have an entire lineup of chromosomes and just one is stepping up out of line and the rest are all normal, it's really easy to spot. But if the entire line has taken that extra step up, it's not easy to spot. The test doesn't pick it up. So while it, we can pick up a lot, we don't pick up everything. And so it is important to know that miscarriages still do occur because there are some genetic reasons and there's some non-genetic reasons. So and I think Amanda might have had multiple things going on, which often happens with our patients with recurrent pregnancy loss, correct? Yeah. Well, and for me, um, <laughs> Dr. Obedient, you always say it so much more eloquently than I do. I, you know, I'm totally non-clinical. Um, but for me, I was born with a heart-shaped uterus, um, bicornuate uterus is, you know, typically what it's called. And it sounds so lovely because it's the shape of a heart. And no, 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 it's not, a, it's not fun. Kind of like the 69 chromosomes. It's not right, sexy. Right, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I also live in Las Vegas, so I totally get that. Um, See, I am not perverted. Totally no. normal women think well, about this way. I mean, not that Amanda's totally normal, but, but she's pretty 
normal. We're normal for Las Vegas. Let's put it. <laughs> so, um, so I was born with this defect in my uterus and, um, you know, I had gone to multiple, uh, reproductive endocrinologists before getting to Dr. Bedian, my superhero. Um, and so I was told, Oh, just keep trying. And you know, you're fine. Just, you know, you're young, you can do this. And, um, and then by the time I got to Dr. Beattie and she was like, no, you have a birth defect. Like this is, you know, you may be able to carry the term at some point, but how much, you know, stress and anxiety and, and, and pressure are you going to put on yourself and your marriage in order to get to the point of having a child? And, you know, that's when she recommended IVF as well as a surrogate to carry our child. And it was like this weight was just lifted off of my shoulders because I I didn't feel like all of a sudden the pressure, you know, was no longer just on me that I had, you know, support and other people that I could lean on and not just my body. Now I will say, I understand that that is not the case for a lot of women. Um, you know, surrogacy, while it's become incredibly, um, uh, well-known and it's getting increasingly, uh, popular. It's, it's still extremely expensive. Um, and, and not everybody needs a surrogate. You know, I, I think it's very easy to start uh, snowballing and saying, Oh, that's it. I can't carry, I can't do it. Um, and for most women, all they need is, is intervention like IVF. So when we were doing all the testing, you, we did a, a fair amount because there was a lot of counseling that went into this decision. I mean, I remember sending you to the maternal fetal medicine docs and saying, okay, look at it from their perspective. You know, is there anything else that could be going on leading to this? Because the, the tendency for doctors is once you find a reason for whatever's going on, you say, okay, we're good. And you stop looking for reasons. And, and especially when somebody else but when a patient comes to me who's seen a, a bunch of physicians, the thought is, okay, everybody is attributing it to this one thing. Let's just make sure that there's nothing else going on. And so what we did is I think at that point, you had been told you maybe had an arcuate uterus or just a mild heart shape. And so we actually did surgery and, and took a look inside. And it's a combination of ultrasound and camera with the hysteroscopy. And that's the beauty of having the skill set that REIs do is that we live and breathe ultrasound. So I can't tell you the number of times I just bring one into surgery because it's like having an extra set of eyes mm -hmm. without having to be nearly as invasive. And when I actually got in there and was looking, I was like, oh, this is a lot deeper than what we have seen on the HSG, on the ultrasounds and those types of things. So we really wanted to assess, is one of these cavities big enough that we can direct a pregnancy to it and and make it go. And the decision that we were having uh, and the conversations we were having to make were, do, do we want to take the chance? Like we can gear towards one, this one side that's a little bit bigger than the other side, but you've been through this multiple times and do you want to do this again? And that's even knowing that there was still the potential for something else going on because I think, you know, numbers were lower than we were maybe otherwise expecting given your age, given, given the other, the rest of the picture. Um, it wasn't just the uterus that we were looking at here. Right, right. How did you, when um, Carrie mentioned needing to potentially use a surrogate, like where where did your mind go at that point? What what led you to your choice of surrogate? So I am first and foremost a businesswoman, and the very first thing that went through my mind was dollar signs and all of the dollars going away from my bank account. And, um, and so I, I immediately went into financial mode and how do I make this happen? And, um, I am very, very, very blessed to have an amazing supportive family who was able to shy of sell their left arm, help us out. And I know that that's not normal. That's not the case for a lot of people. Um, I do think that there is a lot to be said for infertility coverage, making it more affordable for women and, and for couples and then also making surrogacy more affordable. But that's an, immediately where I went. And so Dr. Bedient connected me with three different surrogacy agencies. And, you know, while I listened to what they were offering me, I was more so said, okay, yeah, what is the, what's the number at the bottom of the quote? Mm -hmm. like, I just want to know if this is realistic or not. Yeah. And um, the first agency that I met with, U.S. Surrogacy, um, Dawn Baker, you know, she could tell that I was super type A, shocker. And she was like, you know what? I'm not going to pressure you at all. You, you know, you tell me what works for you and for Mark. And she was just so lovely. And I couldn't get her out of 
my head, even though I wanted to just be a number cruncher. And even after meeting with the other two agencies, I was like, I, I don't need to keep looking any further. I think that U.S. surrogacy is amazing. And it was. It was at that point, once we got the surrogacy agency involved and I knew I had Dr. Bedian in my corner, um, it was, and I had already done IVF and I already had embryos on ice. Um, from there, it was pretty much smooth sailing. Just as a side note, Amanda, because I have several patients right now, they're looking at different surrogacy agencies. And, you know, I think even for me, it's a little challenging to try and figure out, you know, who to, who to go with. So just to, since you went through that process, what are like the top three things that you think are the most important in a surrogacy agency that you'd look at? Uh, I think it's very similar to how you choose your reproductive endocrinologist. Um, for me, it was, you know, Dr. Obedient had to, had to be able to put up with my level of crazy. Um, <laughs> because, you know, I, I ask a lot of questions and I come in with my little notepad and I'm very like, prescriptive and by the book. And she was able to answer all my questions and she was able to put up with me. And, um, and the same thing with the surrogacy agency, you have to, this is a relationship. You have to feel comfortable with these people. You have to feel confident, um, that they're advocating on your behalf, um, that they, that they work with attorneys and that they work with the best surrogates and that they, they're very, very dedicated to their surrogates. And if an agency isn't dedicated to their surrogates, I think that's very telling. So you had mentioned that you had seen a number of different doctors before you got to Dr. Obedient. What made you change a doctor? I have a wonderful GYN who I have been going to for years and, and met working in a hospital, working in healthcare. And, you know, I went for my annual one year and I said, this is everything that's going on. It's still not working out. And she said, will you please just go to Dr. Beatty? And I said, okay. (laughs) (laughs) Stupidest thing. It's like, you know, you want to do your own research and you think you're real good at it. And sometimes you just need to shut up and listen to smart people. Yeah. Well, we all know Carrie's amazing. So, I mean, it's no surprise. She is amazing. You picked a good one. I paid them all to say that. <laughs> um, but the, the funny thing, Amanda, is that you you keep saying you're all type A and difficult. And yes, you were very organized. Like you knew what questions you wanted to ask and you asked all of them. That's That's good. And I would recommend that for any and every patient is before you walk into your appointment, if there are questions you have, write them down because there's so many things that we cover that even when we go off on tangents, they are relevant tangents and they are worth having. But don't lose sight of the questions you really came into the appointment wanting to know the answer to. And and sometimes we're going to say, I can't give you that answer right now. You got to wait either until we get more tests back, until we get through this part of the procedure, or whatever. But, um, but one of the things that I remember most was was just giving a pep talk of you can do this you're still going through this you're going to you're going to be just fine and that was actually probably the more surprising thing going through this because you have accomplished so very much that that I think sometimes people forget that those pep talks are what's necessary and and really some of the best things that a reproductive endocrinologist can do and, and that's probably, you know, there's a million reasons why I say Dr. Obedient is my superhero, but that's probably the number one reason is after the first round of IVF, um, my body just likes to do things differently. It just does not like to conform. So um, unfortunately, we had our first round of IVF fail and my husband turned to me and he said, I can't watch you do this anymore. I, it's just, it's too hard. And, and I said, yeah, you know, let's go talk to Dr. B and, and see what she says. And we were pre- pretty much ready to throw in the towel, um, which probably sounds really stupid to women who have gone through multiple rounds of IVF. But at that point we were just done. And, you know, I remember walking in and we're like, okay, we've got this. We know what we're doing. We know what our decision is. We're going to go adopt or do something else. And, you know, and Dr. Bedian said, oh, no, 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 no. I haven't even opened my bag. Of <laughs> Hold on a second, you know, and, and that for me was life-changing because I think with anybody else, I probably would have gone on a different path and not to say that there's anything wrong with uh, adoption or, or foster care. I think it's phenomenal. Um, but my Emma is my world. I mean, she's perfect. So sum it up and tell us about your Emma. Tell us about the, the moments when you saw your Emma. First, um, uh, having a surrogate 
in the middle of a pandemic was quite interesting. Um, you know, pretty quickly, I wasn't able to go to the doctor's appointments. I wasn't able to see the ultrasounds. Or hear the, I could hear the heartbeat over the phone, but you know, it was, it was a different experience for sure. And then the fear of walking into a hospital uh, where not only you're not the patient, and so how are they going to treat you and how are they going to treat you differently than they would if you were the mother, uh, the, the mother conceiving, not the, you know, I am the mother and, and that's the, the number one thing. But there was just a lot of stress in that environment, but it all went away when I saw her. And, you know, it all went away in that delivery room when she finally got here and I could breathe for the first time in five years. Aww. She's perfect. I mean, she's a diva for sure. Like <laughs> at four months, <laughs> <laughs> everything I did to my mother is coming back to me in spades, <laughs> but that's okay. She's a strong woman. And I love that about her. And she's just the prettiest, uh, most perfect tiny human that's ever lived. So it was worth everything. That's wonderful. Thank you so much for talking with us today, Amanda. And and it's always wonderful to see you. Like I love getting getting the baby announcements, getting the pictures, getting the all of it. And one of the things that you have said that I have actually pirated from you <laughs> um, is in talking to patients, the the phrase, you are not broken. And and the first time I heard that was Amanda speaking, you know, doing, doing public speaking. And, and I think that was the name of your campaign, actually, as you were going through and, and that has resonated. And I think that has helped so many women. And the phrase you are not broken is, it's true. It's very true. And so thank you so much for coming on today. And thank you so much for all that you do for all the women in the state. And I'm sure across the country as it's as it's coming because I have no doubt that we are going to see more of you in our world, um, certainly in this state. And, and I have a feeling far beyond that as well. Thank you so much for having me. I, I cannot tell you how much I appreciate it. Thanks, Amanda. Our pleasure. All right. Well, to our listeners, thank you so much for listening and be sure to tune in next week for more. Also be sure to subscribe and leave us a review in iTunes. We would love to hear from you. And you can also visit us on Fertility Docs Uncensored to schedule an appointment with any of us or submit specific questions. All questions will be answered on the podcast anonymously. So don't hold back. The more embarrassing, the better. All right. We'll speak to all y'all soon. Bye, guys. Take care, guys. Bye. Bye. Bye.